Hello and welcome to This and That. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. Hi. Hi. For all of you who are new here, this is a skating lesson. We are going to discuss everything involved in skating, Olympic sports in general, Maggie Haney. So, so hit that subscription button below, subscribe, smash that like button, and join us for another edition of this and that. Oh, how's your week? <laughs> what a going? nice intro, Dave. I know, I was, feeling, is... I was feeling, you know, alive. The, it's like, you know when the, the finally the weather opens up after, cause it's been so, it's been so rainy, you know, it's been mm -hmm. so, and we're in quarantine. And this weekend the sun is out and I just feel like Julie Andrews going through the <laughs> meadows of the field at the beginning of that movie. Like, have you ever just been that gay and that in, in all yes. aspects, in all <laughs> meanings of the word, you know? Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like those skaters that really have just been like holding back until the final footwork sequence. Yeah. <laughs> and now like the sun is bursting out. Oh. Yes, this is that time. This is Mariah's choreographed Where's smile it? from nature. Yeah. Is it going to stay? I don't think so, but it's it's for now and we're moving into this period. We're in the moment. We're going to love it in the moment. Yeah. This is the moment. Damn all the odds. Yes. <laughs> it's our Paul Wiley moment. Okay. That's right. So how's your week been? What's been going on? Oh, you know, I'll tell you what, I, I am like going a little OCD in my apartment. I am reorganizing every drawer. I am recataloging every piece of music. Like I'm really gone overboard with the nesting. So but you have tchotchkes, but you have like minimalist with, with highlighted tasteful tchotchkes. So like, I don't feel like you have a lot oh, of- Oh yeah, if by tchotchkes you mean Art Deco vases, then yeah, tchotchkes. <laughs> wow. Uh, I was just speaking colo- I mean, <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm, but it's the inside drawers. Okay. It's like color coordinating the Roy G. Biv spectrum of my hanging shirts. Like I'm talking next level. Well, when man. when else do you have time to do that? This is wonderful. Bingo. Yeah, I agree. I think I'm making the most of the situation. <laughs> I've been making the most a lot of quarantine too. So I am. Well, like... you're gonna come out so much more fit than anyone else. Like this is insane. <laughs> well. I don't know that anyone else, but I, so I was skating first before I got back in and I was so eager to be on the ice again that I was kind of holding back in my off ice and like doing yoga and stuff, but trying not to like punish my body because I just wanted to skate again. And you kind of know that like to get to where you want to go, you have to go through that like awful period of pain and soreness. And I tried to avoid that, but then, you know, you, you don't get the same results, but I wasn't jumping that much. So I didn't feel like I needed to be like fully, you know, in, but yeah, this quarantine has just gotten me back into athletic form. Jonathan, we are. Are you, and are you enjoying the online exercise medium? Yes. Okay. You don't find it like I found it even when I put it through the TV the couple of times I tried like I don't know it's also like I don't know if you found in college I did better on big projects if I left my dorm room like I would go to a library or go somewhere that's because so... then that's all I was focusing on so I feel the same about exercise when it's in my own living room I'm like is this real okay, I have two different thoughts on that because when I was a writer and writers are in your head you know I I would, st I, I did my best projects. I had a really, I think I still sort of do this system where I will like make notes and maybe I haven't done like tangible written work on something, but I have thought about this and brainstormed it and spend like walks with thought energy where I'm thinking about my project and I'm researching, but I haven't actually written it yet, which is mm -hmm. annoying because some people love like the 50 million draft stage. And I'm the kind of writer where the idea needs to be so strong and so clear to me that the words will come, but I need the oh, idea I feel the same. Yeah. to be yeah. like razor Home. sharp, right? Mm -hmm. So, cause I'm working on something for the Maggie Haney, which we'll discuss. And I've been talking to different parents and I don't want to put it out there before I feel like it's ready because I have. You're formulating still. I'm yeah. formulating like what I really think because I think that it impacts a lot of other coaches and things potentially in the US, like huge and we'll get into that. But so like when I'm working on a project like that, so I would have to work, but then I would try to write things during the day and I just like couldn't. If someone was around, I would get distracted or I would think about my homework before a class or like that's when you're gonna take a nap. I did my best writing like 
before and after dinner, like standing at the computer screen from like five to like four in the morning, which is not great because you get in a terrible cycle of being up late and then napping and then being, but that's how I kind of did write things very well. Okay. So, okay. All right. Was my best work, but being very caffeinated at 1230 in the morning. And sometimes I would put music on when I would get in the flow and it would like come out, like the words feel like they're coming out and somehow you feel like, well, that's, the, it's kind of a hyper focus. Do you yes. experience hyper focus when you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yes. When you're writing. Yeah. I mean, I, Figured, but I thought I would still form it. So like then, like, you put on, like, <laughs> classical music or something that you think is going to, like, help the words come. Yeah. And then you just, like, sometimes you have so much energy and stuff because of the the creative energy. So you're, like, dancing almost at, like, 3.30 in the morning. You know, It's a high, I would think. In, in its own way, like, curating performances and stuff can be the same. And some people like to just keep trying and trying and trying. But I'm more like you. I feel like I like to marinate more in the actual core of an idea mm -hmm. and i wonder i wonder this about skating too like i don't know how much is just trial and error let's try it let's change it let's try it let's change it versus like taking the time to really just think about the core idea and then like you're saying when you go to do it it almost does it by itself you're just riding a wave of momentum that you've created yeah but for work i work in where you have to like put the draft and then 7,000 people edit it and put their thoughts mm. in and then you meet and then you do and like that's a different way of working for me but I do learn yeah. from it it depends yeah. like who you send stuff to so um working communications it's like awful somewhat in that way I actually really enjoy editing videos because I can like make more creative decisions and exercise totally. that way when you get to that point um like even in work when we put together videos but with the exercise medium, what I find really interesting is like positive energy and negative energy, right? So some of these conditioning workouts can be very hard. So my parents, if you've seen of like your friends with me on Facebook or Instagram, like my parents like get up to do the workouts with me. Um, but you know, they're 65 and they are trying to work out with like, you know, I'm 34, other people are and 40. Olympic athletes. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, and I like mean, other people so... are like 15, 16, like, right. So my parents will do it, but like they have commentary while we're doing it. Right. So, and it's also like, <laughs> that's me too. I talk too much. I'm like, why Managing she moods, say? you know, yeah. she's going to be like, Mom, exactly. don't give up. It'll be okay. It'll be okay. You know, like you can do this. You can do it. Yeah. You know, he talks too fast. Why is he counting so fast? You know, he needs That's to... what I always say, because when they introduce the exercises too quickly, I'm like, I don't even know what they're saying. It's too fast. Where's the fire? Like, why can't you just explain it to us? <laughs> <laughs> it's like so mentally draining. So they yeah. weren't there today. It was easier. I do find that a 50 minute workout feels like half an hour compared to a 60 minute workout for whatever reason oh, that like okay. a delta of 10 minutes makes such a difference and a 45 okay. one just like it feels like you did nothing you're like i didn't even do anything today this you're so crazy. intense like when i've been doing like the occasional one it's like seven minute <laughs> like jumping jack exercises and then you're like oh yeah that 50 to 60 minute mark really gets you down and i was like yeah i believe you dave i believe I, you i don't know if igor did this on purpose but in the first week someone in the class because there are people that do the class that watch tsl will have to comment but in the first week he only did like 30 minutes 35 minutes and then like it gradually got longer all of a sudden one week like second third week it was an hour right yeah and i was like did he only do shorter in the beginning because he was just getting in his groove or did he know that we were all out of shape because all of a sudden <laughs> amazing well it's hard to know how long you could sustain that kind of focus and energy through an online platform i would think uh, i mean i would think 30 minutes is like a tangible like we can fill that time and feel useful but i'm glad it must be very used well to it and i'm actually uh, wondering like can we keep doing this when we're back because i actually find it's a pain in the neck to drive somewhere and schedule an hour and then can I do this here? But this like 7 p.m. I'm home after work, like that would be a great time to condition every night. Like I would. That's incredible. And it, it can reach just a wider audience. That's what's really nice about it. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I could threaten to do it. Um, they would but like I would it, be... Jonathan. Susan Britt would like you to do it. Okay. I know, but you know what it is? I feel too... Um too out of shape to even begin it. Like, I, I would think be Susan like, Brent is older than my parents, so I think you'd be okay. I mean, you, you oh, don't but have that has nothing to do with physical conditioning. <laughs> like, so I sometimes like I, I, it's so interesting is that like, I can do 10 push-ups, but like, 
the, you do Igor does one exercise where you like in the warm up you walk out you do two you go back to your stretch you go four but he does them so fast that after I do eight my arms are like dead but when you have time to do ten later on that's like no problem but like the rapid fire okay. is yeah. yeah and stuff like that makes me nervous for singing and maybe I just use it as an excuse but because I have such like weak upper arms and stuff I end up engaging my neck non-stop and there's so much neck tension when I try to do that sort of stuff oh, that's, yeah. so I would really need like a remedial like <laughs> situation so well body by Fleur is I do her as well so and okay. that's that's very good. Um, okay. Also difficult. Yeah, None of these are thing. easy. Okay, yeah, like no. these are not entry level. You know, you know the ballet <laughs> class is easier, like physically. Okay. Although even that's gotten more intense with the exercises that we're doing. But I feel like I'm learning more. So I'm like I'm really developing during quarantine. Part of me wants it to end, and part of me is like, but my my tendus and my like have, have improved as a result yeah, yes exactly so. that's gratitude for a difficult situation i think that's beautiful dave and then you know I'm, I'm working on all of my um uploads right so i there's a man in oregon who still has like an amazing vhs dvd collection and people that and i talk to this amy who you know and we trade and things like that and then i so like some of the files i'm like the quality is not that great so of course I'm like, you know, delving into his list. I've, um, I basically gave him like the equivalent of a quarantine check to like get updated films. So I'm going to yeah. have like the 68 worlds and the 80 Olympics and like fun That's things. incredible because so much of that footage from back then yeah. are just the, the same little clips we've seen in montages years and years now. Oh, so. that would be amazing. You know, I don't like to just do anything halfway. So, you know. That is correct, eh? so, <laughs> <laughs> And also, I wanted to have a lesson to everyone. So, I did, I have the Thai Babylonia coloring book, which she sent to us, which is great. She sent to yes. me, and I love it. It's so fun. And I got that other one that people were talking about, the one that That's was... That's the like, one I have also. There's some pretty hilarious photos in that one. Obviously, are the some of them like based on Gordy yes. and Gray? I mean, I love the mom with... I mean, obviously, like, this is... <laughs> we're of an era. Yeah, exactly. It's like an 80s. But, you know, I wanted to tell people to pay attention when you're buying things on Amazon because this one was, like, gently used and I didn't even realize it. I just, like, Wait, bit the Dave. bullet. Dave. And also... Who gently used that and put on the blue eyeshadow and stuff? It looks like a like a little drag queen. This very drag here, right? Oh yeah, someone watched Peggy. Someone that's a that's did. chartreuse if ever I've seen it. But this the man rouge looks. Data. Well, if you watched our judging video of 2010, he looks like he's having a step sequence moment. Okay, <laughs> like I, I just. That, wait, Dave, you bought a, like a colored in coloring book. I thought you were going to say there was just the one. Now you've just purchased like a coffee table book. <laughs> I mean, it's like 60%. It's like 40% colored. But you know, I mean, they really went to town. <laughs> Look at the hair on that one. That was the Michelle Kwan you hair. You know, I could send it back, but who really cares? You know? Yeah, you just should have asked for it autographed so it was worth more for each artist's page. <laughs> I mean, this person had a lot of feelings about There's a really um, super funny looking death spiral in there. Isn't there? Yes. Yes, there I is. I think that that might be my favorite. Um, so this, it just goes to show why ties is better, okay? We just... Yeah, because they usually come empty and not already pre-colored in. Yeah, that's <laughs> fair I'm enough. I'm like, I'm judging the coloring. This was a weak effort, okay? Come on. That is fairly inside the lines. I cannot believe someone <laughs> so Why would you... 50% color a book and then try to sell it. You ratchet. Because someone like you buys it. <laughs> Negative review. Would not recommend this seller. Negative. <laughs> Awful. I may, but I, now I'm like, maybe I just bought too quickly because I was buying multiple things. I didn't even think. It like never dawned on me. Jonathan, color. it never dawned on me that someone would think to color in 50% of a book and then sell it. Wasn't that a Judge Judy where someone was selling pictures of iPhones for hundreds of dollars because and they would show the picture of the iPhone and then you would spend, you know, three, four hundred dollars and then she would send you the photograph How of the iPhone. feel about this? Because I bet it does say picture somewhere small, right? And if you looked at the dimensions, it says it's like eight and a half by 11 inches and, you know, this thin. 
So I don't remember how it ended, but. A lawyer would love that. Okay. Yeah, right? So. Oh man, that would be, there are lawyers at work that would love to just fight each other on that. Okay. Yeah, just totally dissect that. <laughs> I don't miss that at all. No, okay. such a toxic way to look at life. <laughs> I used to be responsible for managing the edits in these like big hospital contracts between the insurance company and the hospital system. And just to know. Yeah. That's dark. It's dark. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that... Should have edited the whole thing right out. <laughs> and you'd be talking about like things that are so abstract that you can't even it was always the joint in the joint derivative intellectual property section that you'd be like, like where are we, if we develop of... i or like if you develop a, like intellectual property together who gets ownership of it when this is over things you'd never want to think about okay like yeah just yeah what if it's a prenup yeah <laughs> yes nightmare mm -hmm. there are the, okay just it's behind you now <laughs> Okay, so yeah, that was that. But on other notes, um, I did a morning chat with Meryl. They originally were toying with calling it muffins <laughs> with Meryl, and I said absolutely not, absolutely not. Okay, Meryl's muffin. <laughs> She's a national treasure. You you just yeah. don't do it. You can't invite this. Yeah. So of course, it was very Meryl, as I'm sure that if you invited Tessa Virtue, it would be equally. Tessa and and good, but like it had like the Meryl. She I know I was like looking at her house, like I was on there, and she was just she's very on. But very so what good. did she have as her background? So she has like she had like a white wall behind her, and she because I think she would curate it more than like when we've been seeing everyone else's homes in the other tele not telethons, but yes. you know what I mean. I'll yeah. make it the thumbnail picture. I like debated okay. it. It okay. was her. She has a decorative ladder that they then would like hang little towels on, but it was like- I expect dressed. that from her. And she had this wonderful cable knit sweater on that then had like poofy sleeves halfway and it looked very expensive and nice. And it, like it was lavender. She, remember, I mean, her ice dance dress did incorporate a lot of purple. She knows what she looks good in. She just presented yeah. herself very well. Okay, lovely. And I have to say that she's one of those ice dancers and skaters that always knows to make, to put it in perspective that we miss skating, but things are so much bigger and right. very trained and on in a way that's, that's incredible. many of these skaters are not. So Yeah, so do you think she took the, do you think she comes by that naturally? Do you think she took the media training that taught her how to like drive home certain points? So I think what was very clear is that Meryl won the Olympics because she prepared harder than anyone. And during that time, they had the advantage that they trained with their top competitors who were injured, right? But right. over a four year period, so they were able to gain momentum and gain power. Because I think when people talk about them, they never say that they were the best dancers, but they'll be like, they were the fastest. And when you are the fastest and dynamic like that over a long period of time, you build momentum with the judges, you build the consistency and stuff like that. She also talked about um, at like what percentage you practice at, because she said that that cup of Russia that where they messed up in 2008, where the British commentators would reference it. Um, she said that they were training, that maybe they would train at 70 or 80 percent. And they went in that competition thinking that they needed to do more than you ever do before. You know, like when you have the nerves and they realize they had an opportunity and they wanted to go like a thousand percent full out and that's when they completely wiped out and because as frank will say do what you do at home or what however he he words it and this has happened to me a couple of times in singing you practice you know parts of an opera you're ready to go you're ready to go the minute you get on stage suddenly there's this weird knee-jerk reaction that uh, says what if you just do it totally different than you've been practicing it for the first time right now? You, you I've had totally that, where you feel that. like you need to do more energy and more. Yeah. yeah, and you're like, but you've never practiced that in. Like, do what you do with that extra surge of energy, and it will be amazing. But suddenly, you find yourself denying yourself everything you've achieved in the practice if you do that. I totally agree with it. I found that she would give good answers depending on the question, right? And like sometimes okay. kids were, I mean, it was Meryl, so everything was, that's a great question. Mm. Yeah, and it also cool. buys you time. That's, pa yes. that's pageant training. What a great question. Yes, I believe that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She would do great in a pageant. But I think Tessa yeah. would too. 
and oh, Tana. Totally. I think it would be like one, two, three. Mm, she did yeah. have a great point that she said that at competition, there's in many of the disciplines, there's so much uh, focus on what your competitor is doing, especially you're aware of it, whether you want to be or not. But right. she said that because they trained with Tessa and Scott every day, they never even thought about that when they were at competition because it wasn't like they were going to learn any new information. And I imagine it's right. the same from the Atari girls. The only difference there is like who's having a good jumping day versus not the best. Or how day. the judges are going PCS wise, I think, yeah. you know, stuff that's out of their control a little bit. But I, I think that's totally true. Also, there are no surprise elements for them at the top. I imagine for the gymnasts too, when they have the semi-centralized training, if it's like two Americans, like Nasty and Sean, they showed that on the, I'm sure they knew what each other did from training together so many times throughout the year and in training that they weren't surprised by anything. It wasn't like you were going to be yeah. like, oh, what's Nastia doing on the bars now? <laughs> right. So. Right. I thought that was, yeah. And also she's definitely, I know that Megan Duhamel has talked about um, like traveling to competition with food as a vegan, but Meryl did it period so that her body would feel the same way so that she would do the same exercises at home that she did at a competition that she like for warm up that she would do the same exercise like eat the same food no matter what so it was you could tell that she well, was we know, very we prepared know people Jonathan. have had stomach issues when you when you're traveling like that with the air travel and the time changes and often unique cuisines when you get to places i don't know i mean it speaks though mm -hmm. to her commitment and there's a great book called Talent is Overrated. And it's a sports and performing arts book. And it's not to say that Meryl and Charlie are untalented, but they yeah. didn't have that natural thing Tessa and Scott did. Mm -hmm. So they literally did every single thing they could. Yeah, And they did. It's, it's an incredible lesson for those who feel outside of that top 1% of raw talent, mm -hmm. that there's still totally a place for you. She talked about Charlie being more talented than she was. And then she talked about how the year of the Olympics is the first time that some of the lifts would bother Charlie's back. So they would do the lift on In the- In 10 or 14? In 14. Okay. So that they would do, they would do two free dances back to back and then sections, which is also interesting. Um, and like she talked a little bit about how Marina would train the endurance and stuff of that. And she talked about how he would maybe do the lifts in the first program and then leave them out after that way it wasn't like he was going to gain strength from the lift. He would, it was only going to diminish the return. So okay. like knowing your body through years of training. And I thought that she went, so she would say that like, well, this is a cliche to learn from mistakes, but then she talked about how they did that. And I thought that that was interesting. Much more interesting than just saying you learn yes. from a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I thought that that was interesting to like, think about like mistakes I've made in competition, you know, whether it be, mentally or not because before i competed i was like i need to win i need to win i need to win but like you talk about like what you do to yourself mentally rather than i get to do this you know, and i know and it sounds so cheesy doesn't yes. it like all this or i deal with this with performance all the time because mm -hmm. i have like a lack of gratitude for it sometimes and mm -hmm. sometimes um a talent can feel like a burden. Yeah, and you the nerves I mean? can I, really get over ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's but so, just a small perspective mm -hmm. shift that way changes the entire mood. And it's usually that intangible thing that we can never describe why we liked someone's performance more than another. It's because they were hooked into wanting to perform. And she, one of many people, she said that having a partner made her less nervous. And I think that that is true. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that she felt um, when she was doing singles that it uh, made her so nervous that she wasn't really enjoying it versus when she competed with Charlie, she was nervous, but it was in a different way of wanting to do yeah. well rather than feeling like the world was crashing down and she couldn't eat or couldn't sleep or that kind of a thing. So mm. I thought that was interesting. interesting. It was, yeah. She was, yeah, those sound like actually really. really insightful things to hear from her. Yeah. No, so. That was, so. That was good. And I know that Gracie Gold did one for Ravi. So there's a lot of stuff. And I know that Corey Aid and Scott Hamilton, you're seeing a lot of certain coaches who are like very resourceful, be creative. You see Tom Z, apparently he and Vincent had like a very awkward discussion on Lutz from Quad, but there was like a lot of self-promotion in there. People gave a lot yeah. of notes based on our previous conversation. And Okay. Yeah. I would, I would agree with all of it. 
Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> so, and I did one with Tim Gable that Igor did where people could ask him questions. Like, because in a lot of these, they'll show you the exercises and then he kind of would ask, like people would ask him questions about like where should you put your foot what what are you thinking about with your head and that was interesting i thought he's great at that he's, he's very so, good I, he's very eloquent and has yeah. like a he's mm-hmm. he has like a kind relationship with the sport right now yeah. yeah so he was he was good i did one with kehlani and isadora who they were they got us jumping but it was so funny because i did it i did a workout class before and I hadn't been jumping before. And it was good that it got me to pre- start my off ice jumping. So I was just focusing on getting in shape. And, and uh, But we did like a hardcore conditioning for an hour before it, right? And we get on to do a jump master class. And they spent the first 40 minutes, because they didn't do the class before, being like, let's do conditioning exercises to get us ready to jump. <laughs> and like... <laughs> you were warm. <laughs> at a certain, I think... I can like have a little problem with my SI joint in my back and they were doing like these jump twists and I, I like tweaked it just like I heard like a little bit of a pop. So I wound up, I took like, a couple days where I eased off because earlier in quarantine, I was working out so hard every day and then I went to put my jeans on one day and I felt my back like pop and felt like this like, Ugh. it almost felt like oh, metal gosh. grinding upon metal. So Ugh. you don't want that to happen. My, so. No. <laughs> All like the fun things of skating that we don't. Yeah, these are intense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So Maggie Haney suspended for eight years. I have, I had you watch the ranch part to get to Mm -hmm. meet Maggie Mm -hmm. Haney. And I read a little bit of the um, press articles Mm -hmm. uh, and some of um, Lori's statement. And I think the, Lori was wonderful and eloquent and somewhat lying because it all goes through an agent and strategic about what they said. And we'll discuss. Why. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. It was just intriguing because obviously we know there was a culture of this. This was just how you did this. And it's, <clears throat> I know that this exists in skating. Yes. However, it's so interesting because when I was such a fanatic initially in the nineties, you know, my go-to coach that I always loved seeing was Frank Carroll. Mm. And the idea that someone like Frank Carroll was pulling mm. those shenanigans seemed rather far-fetched. So I did it, skating seemed like somehow it was gonna be more sophisticated and classy mm-hmm. than people in tracksuits screaming at children, you yes. know? Uh, and so, and we've heard so many things about the Carollis and how intense things were. Um, <clears throat> so I'm sure that there was this era of it, but we're kind of out of that era, it seems. And even when I was watching some of the videos or where it would be normalized even within the sport as much as it might have earlier, it reminded me of that horrifying rhythmic gymnastics thing you had me yes. watch. Where when she's when um mm-hmm. Haney was coaching Lori on bars, she goes, Okay, go clean. And I was like, that's your that's your suggestion. Also, did you is notice it... they edited it out that thing? So that to me is the craziest thing. And I've talked about this a little bit, but in the interview with Maddie Larson, the fact that USA Gymnastics knew that they had a, a doctor, right? That was molesting. They didn't, maybe they, they didn't know how many, but they knew bad, right? And they knew it was at the ranch. They then had all of the same gymnasts who were molested do this whole puff piece for NBC about how great the whole thing is. And right. all of those girls still lie because they know that they have to to play the game to make the team. That talks right. about how like insidious yeah. the game is. And interesting. Like, it's just like it just shows like this thing that makes you want to like vomit, right? When you see yeah. like, how. And I've been talking to a lot of parents and from Haney's gym and, you know, because they're different people have experienced the same thing and have slightly different perspectives on it. Sometimes no one has ever argued that Maggie is a nice person. That is not, like no one. Argues so so let me start at the base question I have yeah. as a quasi outsider here. Why, why would anyone go to her? Is She's it very technically good shooting? for the okay. uneven bars and for, I think for the balance beam. And she's very detail oriented and she can, I think with the success of Lori and packaging and putting it all together, she's quite technically great. And all of the colleges are very into her gymnast because of how 
she prepares them, that they could, you don't have a lot of deductions. She cares about the flexibility still. She cares about the execution, the form. And do you believe that comes from knowledge of technique and training yes, skills? Yes, but or do you think it's like a fear factor? Well, both. And she okay. is a perfectionist. And I think that this happens with a lot of coaches too, but she was bad before. And some, one parent was telling me that, you know, she was never nice, right? Like, and she would bad mouth and she has a hard edge and she's always had a hard edge. She was the one that was arrested in college for selling booze at party to underage kids. And okay. who knows how she got the booze for you? I don't know if she was of age. Did she have a boyfriend that was of age? I mean, she's a gutter rat who climbed to the top. Like that's who she is. That's how she presents okay. herself. Like, well, and she comes across even in the videos as rather scrappy. Yes, that's mm -hmm. her. And that's, one of the things that's made her successful, but she's nasty. And they said that once she had a little bit of success, like she bought into that system completely and wanted like more and it became like, you know, on steroids. And okay. I think we saw it with Mary Lee Tracy and we see it with a lot of coaches when they like collect top athletes, like Tom, <laughs> remember when he had, remember when he had Jeremy and Ryan and Brandon and Agnes and Rachel and all these people, how many of them can you give individualized attention to? And then we right. even would see Tom, I'll always remember at 2009 nationals that Jeremy was going to do his long, I think. And you heard Tom speaking to Jeremy in a tone and we had seen the Sandy Rucker ice diaries, or maybe it was, no, I said it was after, right? So, or it before or after, whatever it was, you could tell that there's like an insidious part where Tom can have a tone, right? Like you can just like pick up on it the same way that you could pick up on it with um, Maggie Haney and like a different okay. way. And it was how Tom was talking to Sandy Rucker, who by the way, did seem like a pain. And like, why are you training? <laughs> because she was okay. in shape and she didn't seem like she wanted to be there. And, but I think that that's a different conversation than trying to force someone to do something that they don't want to do. And in that case, they never should have done the documentary because that's right. Terrible. Right. Like right. if someone doesn't want to do something and they're injured and they're not in it, you can't make them into right especially when they have an injury and they're not conditioned. So I think Maggie, you go to her to get as much out of you as you can, but she's nasty about it. And I think it's hard with Lori because she was going through puberty during the Olympics. And I was trying to think about this critically, like in gymnastics now with the physical requirements, there are certain things that there are realities about a strength to weight ratio that are, are very difficult conversations to have in a healthy way like how yeah, you Yeah, because that are physics driven, not aesthetic driven. Not aesthetic or, driven. Yeah. And yeah. we don't know if Maggie was based on physics, but she certainly didn't have this conversation in any attempt at a healthy way, right? Like she yeah. would say nasty things that then, you know, to her. And you think about all of these different things. And the interesting thing to me is that eight years is essentially banning someone, right? Like you're essentially you're cutting someone out for two Olympics. So she's going to have to do something else. You're not going to then right. rebuild your career. Right. And unless you, I mean, that's, that's a difficult thing, right? No, the way they're going, she'll be president instead. Or well, that too. Yeah. <laughs> and this could go to an arbitrator, but I was thinking, you know, skating has so far been put in their, like, dug in their heels. Right. But it, it won't last like that forever right like there's a lot of protectiveness and i think what we're seeing is that in gymnastics there are groups of parents that are now getting together so the haney thing happened because over a period of time there were six to eight parents who wrote letters and who got lawyers and with anna lee and her mom there's a similar situation where there's a group of parents and there are groups that are going after this and we haven't seen that in skating and it's more individual and maybe there are fewer numbers but I do, th I was thinking like, well, you want to talk about eating disorders. What if a whole group of pair skaters or a whole group of ice dancers went after their coaches in like situations that we know about? That's a very different conversation. Well, the, it's interesting because mm -hmm. outside, if you take um, 
if we're talking about non-sexual cases, mm -hmm. because yeah. those sort of seem to be in its own sexual are easier, right? Like they are category. Yeah, yeah. The, it's very cut and dry. What is yeah. inappropriate? Um, but this other has to be intrigued because the only kind of person I'm recalling hearing much about it is is Mia Mia Hamada. or Terry. And and well, we hear that not necessarily from within. Yeah. Right. It's interesting because Oda, with his comments. Mm -hmm. That's what fascinates me is what might happen or what is the real story there? Because sure enough, as it's designed to do, I she had me fooled. She looks delightful. Well, How would you know? Yeah. How would you know? But like to know that that's there's a Bella Caroli other... level performance, apparently. That's scary. Except to me, Bella was a worse actor. Bella, I knew, was giving you the show. He knew the cameras were watching his reactions. Um, yes. You have me watch 96 Olympics, yes. which was so fun to revisit that. Um, with that horrible piggy comment. <laughs> <laughs> but he knows he's doing the show. And Mia Hamada always seemed a bit more organic in it. Yes. So it's it's kind of crazy to me when you... It is it is a hard pill to swallow, even though I know it happens. Yeah, it's... It's intense, but then you think about how tiny her girls are and the way that they jump and how they don't get off the ice the same. I mean, it's it's intense. Uh, I mean, the yeah. ice dancers, there are huge problems there, huge problems in pair skating. Uh, and some of it also, another, obviously parents are a factor. And when the girls are underage, even of age, you know, you do make a calculated decision. and And it's hard because... We're grouping in skaters at novice, juniors. I mean, there are different levels where you are accepting the reality, where the parents are aware of it, and these are even sane parents who are aware of it. You do continually make a calculated decision on whether or not you want to train with someone. Like the way that they paint it in the Hernandez article, that's tough to swallow because we know that it's not a hundred percent true. Is that? You know, the parents knew that Maggie wasn't nice, maybe, but they didn't know X, Y, or Z. But in reality, Maggie had flipped out when Lori got an agent and went professional and wasn't going to compete in college. And that there were, like, many other times when Maggie had acted unprofessionally. And, okay. and maybe they didn't know everything, but the way that they're trying to paint it because so many people want to blame the parents completely. Are the parents as involved in, I mean, because at the ranch they weren't allowed, right? They're not allowed at the ranch, but they are, I mean, the thing is, is that gymnasts are younger, right? Because they're not, so they're not driving themselves to PT generally for most of the years. Most of the time the parents will be shuffling them back and forth and dealing with some pretty gnarly injuries that they're all aware of. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, there's a But they don't observe, like, it, in skating, some we know, like, do, those groups of moms don't. that watch. Okay. So it depends okay. if they're allowed to or not and what the rules are. And if that's good or bad, because also the parents go nuts, too. The parents are the other factor in this. Factor that. here, of course. Yes. And to me, you would never practice the same as if you know your parent is watching, I yeah. think. Like, yeah. But then when the parent watches, even if it's protective, they become more invested. And then they then may be applying more pressure, even though they're there to protect you, then they may be. Or, or keep that switch turned on at home or something when it's really time to switch it back off. You yeah. know what I mean? If they start like parent coaching you mm -hmm. or reminding you of things that were said at home off hours, like that would be a nightmare to but me. But there, I mean, I do think that Maggie ultimately was dead wrong, you know, in a lot yeah. of things that she did. And, and there's a lot of fear of blacklisting in terms, in any coaching situation, whether it's with judges and skating or if it's with switching coaches. I mean, look look at what happened with Medvedeva after she switched coaches and the press backlash. And right. Although, she does do some things to bring it on herself. I think we're seeing... Yeah, but what really, the, the extent that it did... Yes. For her was right. absurd from a fan standpoint. Absur yeah, no, that was absurd. I meant the current situation with her. Oh, I see. And I don't know yeah. what you've seen or anything. We could discuss it, but you know, it's 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 just a difficult. Com it's like what is an appropriate punishment? Because if it happens to one coach, it's going to go to 
it'll wind up in arbitration and maybe they'll shave a couple years off from the eight. Maybe it'll go down to four. Maybe it'll go down to five, right? Maybe it'll but go it to doesn't three. really matter because the damage is done. The damage right? is done. And yeah. who's going to go back to her? I mean, some people will, but some people won't. And then there's a the thing where parents are afraid of damaging it for the girls who are there, even if they've left, even if they've graduated. Like, are they going to ruin their careers? Are they helping them? Because the other thing well, is... Well, then you're, that, putting, you're putting a competitive career ahead of people's well-being. And then... Yes, what I know. Happened? But the thing is, is that there also aren't many... There has to be a complete re- re-education of how we coach in this country. And that's what I think it's, we're really coming to. Um, because anyone can be a coach without going to college for it. And that's not to say that the Russian coaches who are horrible... Some of them look, go to college and learn how to coach that way after they've been coached by other people who are also disastrous. But the fact that we don't, like the amount of training and education, everyone complains about the PSA courses that they have to do. But I think that they need to do some real coach, like in, uh, you know, exercise science and, and... Well, because we've all had to do in whatever field or whatever, mm-hmm. continuing education, yes. right? Which we all know is just a huge farce. It's yes. an online course of like, da, 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 da. even when I was guest teaching at Manhattan School of Music, when I had to do like the sexual harassment, yes. reporting of things, training, it's so mindless and ineffective. And you're like, do, 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 just clicking through all this stuff. And it's like, the core concept is correct. Yeah. If all of these courses were not blow off, listen to someone talk about the power of interpretation in vague terms, but actually was teaching craft. I do think that there's going to be obviously a lot of anger, but a public stoning does get other people in line, right? I think my difficult thing is that there are people coaching currently. Like take Al Fong. We've heard mm-hmm. different things from like Ivana Hong after 2008. They were in Little Girls in Pretty Boxes up and That's down doing horrible things. Yeah. They were in... And they put the Carolis in charge of USC Gymnastics, knowing that they called every girl had a nickname. Someone was a pregnant spider. Someone was a pumpkin. Someone was a tank. Someone was a pregnant goat. Like, insidious nicknames for someone that's 12 or 13. And you think about, Mm -hmm. like, that's shocking and horrible. And why? And then they put, they elevated them to that pressure. And I mean, there are a lot of people, I think, that are yet to be sued or could be sued. There's a very interesting... Well, about. they made a choice. They yeah. wanted the results, and that's what they got. And then they but got... But do you think the... if a parent goes to an Alfang and they claim that they didn't know how he was? Right. That's, you didn't that's... care. Yeah. But I don't know what the right reason. Does that mean that he should be allowed to coach? I don't think so. I mean, there's one There's one video of this girl, Karen Tierney. And he Alfang is famous because he had this girl, Julissa Gomez, who vaulted and she broke her neck and was paralyzed. And eventually she passed away from complications that come from being, you know, um, basically in a vegetative state. And she did this vault and it was with the old horse, but he didn't teach her the vault, but he did work on it with her every day. And she always had problems vaulting. He's also like, was not a nice man. The problem with him is that he had four gymnasts that had problems like neck injuries from type things and he also didn't manage him well so you see this girl this video of this person karen tierney misses the horse with her hands lands on her head like neck like right like concussion practice right and then the commentator goes on tv karen did do her second vault and got this and they didn't show it but you think about like someone lands on their neck like on their neck yeah and then they say like oh she did her second vault and you're like, hello. But remember, when we have to talk about parents, do you remember the Tessa Hong? Do you remember that yeah. was, when she got hurt at regionals, they tested her for a concussion? Now, because of the buy system in U.S. figure skating that was abused over the years, even though she had the top score, at the time, she, that ended her season. And the mom filed a grievance, which is still on the USFS website. So I'm not speaking out of turn about anything that's to demonize a parent. But you understand that when a parent is putting so much money and time into skating, that you lose perspective on the fact that your child could have a concussion. Right. And that that's terrible when you're like, but they say they're fine and they can go do it. And you think like, 
well, then maybe we need to adjust the bylaws or have... Yeah, yeah, you know, because it, in no way should this be allowed. Yeah. I mean, there have to be certain exceptions, maybe if someone ranked certain high. I mean, I mean, what's a fair way to do it? But it, it was like overly punishing for someone who is going to be the top skater at that level, right? So, right. yeah, I don't know. It's all difficult conversations to have, especially as we learn more about priorities because it's actually really interesting everything we've been talking about with this haney situation in its own way has been brought up in that tarasova article that yes. we were reading um because one she talks about this atiri criticism or the criticism of atiri rather where she was saying you can't force the girl to do a quad if she's not there to do a quad like these girls really do want the kids are all ambitious lawyer hernandez was ambitious this one yeah these are kids that want to make it right i mean so so their argument being they're not forcing them to but of course that's like (laughs) in the same way a child can't consent (laughs) because they don't and it doesn't mean that a child deserves to confuse just because they're ambitious so right but you do know that Lori was ambitious i mean that girl wanted to be a star which is probably she wanted to make the Olympics. When she was on TV at the Olympics, she winked at the camera before the routine. I mean, this is someone who wanted- Was born for it. Yes. Yeah. A total natural. Yeah. So you think about that and- And was their relationship, like was Lori really the star of that? She was, yeah. Training facility. But that okay. doesn't mean so that Maggie was nicer to her because I think because they were- worried she was going to go through puberty and it was all going to go away and in, right. in some aspects in gymnastics that does happen right so and it's happened with but it's so years. interesting that like it's this abusive dynamic when of course it sounds like she probably needed Lori as well oh, yes yeah a hundred percent that's crazy but that's part of it too that's why you're so nasty to people too a hundred percent a hundred percent but it also in the Tarasova article as we were talking about here like how much attention you can give one individual athlete, Mm -hmm. right? She was talking about um, just sort of her coaching style and she was talking about coming out of quarantine with training all those athletes. And that when you can give that individual attention Mm -hmm. that she can be considered smothering Mm -hmm. with her like love and support Oh, I contrast that to what's happening over here. And you know, you've done interviews. Mm -hmm. Shay told you like, wow, when you train with Tarasova, skating is life and 24 seven. Yes. Like it's nonstop. Or when she was traveling with um, Kavtun. Yeah. And it seemed like he was like, oh my gosh, enough. But it always came from encouragement and yeah, seemingly she, on the outside. I mean, people do support. like her that would go to her for a summer, but it's a high degree of intensity, right? Because yeah. her father believed that too, that you use every aspect you can But there's also a reason that she's not a teacher of maybe like jump technique, right? Right. Like she's a finisher and a pusher. Well, she, and she even said that she was saying, uh, I like to take people at the top who aren't winning. Yes. Not get people to the top. Yes. And that's, that's totally different. And I think Ice Dance was different in the eighties when she was working with like Besmianova and Bukin. And she even had when Klamova and Panamarenko won they had a technician um, that was working stuff with them, even though she knows skating, but there's still ice dance technique and things like that. So I don't know who was the technician with, when she worked with Grisha and Platov. I mean, they had so many years of skating behind them, but yeah, she's a packager and a marketer and uh, and she's brilliant. And And good at it. But I I do find it hysterical because there are, Rumors that not everything is great in Russia and, you know, who knows what is true. I think there's always, whenever you have that many successful people, there's always going to be whispers and someone is never going to be completely satisfied. But she's laying it on thick about a Terry lately. Why is Tarasva doing that? I do not yeah, believe that Yeah, she is that creating is a united Russian front, for sure. Yes. Yeah. 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 And is that to save her own hide? Is she up to something? Like, who knows? I would not trust it for a minute that it's not self-serving in some way for her to act like right terry is a fanatical coach a wonderful coach this coach like but what she also said that i thought was interesting and kind of goes back to the gymnastics thing is where she was saying for other countries figure skating is a i don't entertainment mm-hmm. and in russia it is like an intense sport 
And it's really interesting because, again, the thing you cannot say about all these gymnastics coaches and trainers of this dreadful period were that they were lacking in results. I do think at a certain time, these sports, even in the U.S., unless someone's family has really prioritized education sincerely and given them an out or a roadmap of what they want bigger picture. Not Lori Hernandez trying to remember who um, Julius Caesar was. Julius Caesar. <laughs> that was horrifying and very telling about what their priorities were. Right. Um, I do believe that when you train at that high level, you're making a career choice. And, I, and it's hard to put a pinpoint on like when the age is that the sport is going to become your profession no matter what, right? And I think in quarantine, it does put things into perspective. Like you could have a virus <laughs> and it's going to be hard to make money as a coach. And then maybe less people are going to skate after the virus because there's going to be a recession or a depression. And then there's going to be less money available for that and it becomes like an elite sport even though it already kind right. of was right but I, I think it shows like what people is, that were on the fence i think it, it can push a lot of people out that were in that yeah. in between yeah for sure so i mean it's hard it's it's rough but i, I yeah i think we're going to continue seeing more and more people if, if it goes on a long time because it's interesting because as some states open up in the U.S., and that's not something I really want to get into. Yeah. Um, yeah. Are we going to have a Grand Prix? Because then there are other countries where they're not allowed to travel for the end of the year. So if okay, let's talk is... about it. Because yeah. in both of the or what am I? Let's talk it out. Yeah, <laughs> um, so in the Tarasova article, she was so insistent on this two-week boot break, you know, mm -hmm. boot break-in period. Yes. And also, Buyanova gave an interview where she was also talking about it's this lack of training time mm -hmm. that messes this all up. Oh, so, yeah. And Tarasova was saying she felt that if the training began by June, mm -hmm. they'd be okay by September. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also interesting because already, uh, I don't know if it's conspiracy or not, but seeds are being sown about other people already training. They don't care that everyone in China and there are Japan, rumors that the Russians yeah. train, but li like Tarasova is in some sectors, right? But yeah, and it's a hard one because if someone can train safely, should they be allowed to? Well, it's, sport, it's really hard to define what safely means. What safely Can't wear means. a mask while you're skating. I'm sorry. No. That's true. Now, if someone was in a centralized training situation, which then goes into like all the dangers that can happen there, but say that they were living uh, in quarantine, and, like say that they went from the dorm to the dining hall to the rink, and it was a set group of people who also went from the dorm to the dining hall to the rink, and they all either had antibodies or you know, didn't have it and no one came or left. And maybe you like airdrop food in, right? From Amazon. Uh, <laughs> are you, and you have like peep staff that are taking everyone's temperature and doing things like that because this is all the other stuff. Well, then you're going to get everyone to lie and say they're doing that, but. Well, of course. And, yeah, but, yeah. but should they be allowed to, or is that an unfair advantage to other people? Well, I mean, people have different levels of monetary funding to begin with. I mean, but it becomes, so people are very upset because it's believed that Medvedeva is at a rink in northern Japan. She was in Tokyo and she went to a remote town where she was, of course, spotted and she's training uh, or believed to be training possibly. And they feel that that could be put many people at risk in Japan in danger. Now, there are rinks in Japan that were open. There are some that were closed. I know that people don't want to like talk about this and how... You know, there are some skaters that have like gone to Japan because it wasn't as bad there yet, and I, and I don't think that it's. It's like, the thing, the problem that Medvedeva has. Is that I believe that if you are training. And you're lucky enough, and I think that like Simone Biles owns her own gym. I think that you don't advertise it. Oh, hundred. But she's not, is she? It's that people well, have kind of accidentally stumbled upon her there. Well, they kind of they know that she's there, 
in that city, right? And in, in Awamori or however you pronounce it. And why is she there? Because it makes no freaking sense that she'd be there otherwise, right? And if you can be there, I think it's a bad look to show yourself out and about in the city, even though she was like dancing in a park in her mask. I just think it's a bad look. And this is when people lose perspective about how things appear and that they have this social media need for attention and yet you it just comes across as entitled and insensitive right and take a break from social media for a while like the quest for followers right now is really not that important right or the quest right. for attention. In the, in the, if there's not big picture at the moment yeah. yeah to me that's the if you are training there which is such a complicated issue about whether people, not people should be allowed and, and what is safe and there are so many questions we don't know because you don't know everyone's individual arrangement don't advertise it right like yeah. don't yeah. it's inviting problems from someone that has had a polarizing social media presence in the past so. <laughs> from the mouths of experts yeah okay yeah that to me is the hardest one I mean, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that there are people that are training at night, different ranks or something or temporary situations. But also there's like the, what are people training for? Because you want to get better. Yeah, how hard to be motivated. Yeah. It is hard when you don't know what is next and how hard do I need to be working rather than. Right. right. I mean, how long are the dance classes with Sam Trinard going to be? paying off so I do think it would help to have a coach that gave each person like a fitness goal and if you have like a ballet goal like I want you to improve this about your posture and, and then give well, that like goes back to that individualized kind of programming because yeah. Tarasova was talking about when Kulik broke his leg mm -hmm. and she was able to work with him and they went to every person and they created new exercises that didn't involve this and knew this that worked on that mm -hmm. like it has to be so custom tailored at that kind of top level so one wonders if they're able to give that much personalized attention to each athlete, you know? And she was saying, who if these people have the equipment at home? And she was saying in Russia that all of the equipment that you could take home had been taken out of the rings. You I know, believe that, it. Yes. Yeah, a hundred percent. So. Yeah. And but I'm you're sure... finding a way. You don't have, like, do you have the spinner? I have a spinner that someone gave me as a gift. Okay. I, I'm not a good spinner. I really need to practice my spins when I get back on the ice. Honestly, like, I have, I could work on the spinner now that it's nicer out. Maybe I'll, like, take it in my driveway and just whatever. But I'll add it in. But, you know, there are certain people that, add, that really find this spinner very beneficial. I'm not, I don't know that I, I've found being in shape, working, there are a million things to work on that I feel... Mm. That will improve the spin that will, just inherently. Just in, in general and improve, like I'm working on my flexibility and my strength in positions to hold the spin position. Cause I have a problem like in my camel sometimes like holding the position and I don't, it, especially on the entry. And I don't know that doing the spinner is going to benefit it as much as this. Plus I'm an adult skater and there are only so many hours in the day and I'm, we have other priorities. Yeah, you gotta pick, you gotta pick your priorities here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I didn't know if, so for you personally, that's not as an efficient use of the time as doing general yeah. conditioning. Okay. Yes. And other things that are. Okay. Um, yeah. But at a certain point, I will whip out the spinner. And especially as we get closer to, then I think some of these things become more important. Pull but... out all the stops. Yeah, exactly. Okay, wait, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> so Joe Inman. <laughs> yes. Is he, is he confirmed? So he's going to judge the 2002 Olympic ladies event with us on Patreon. Have you told Juanette? Have you told? I know. I was like, I don't know when I want to tell her, but I'm going to be like, have I got an episode for you? It's going to be It's interesting because I have so many mixed thoughts about it based on how we've been trained at IJS. And right. Right. it's actually one that I've never like sat down and judged. Well, there were, it's, it's interesting for as iconic as that Olympics were, mm -hmm. um, I don't go back and rewatch really any of the women's programs. I, I Maybe really, Sasha Short. Sasha Short I used to rewatch. Yeah. 
Um, but that's about it. I would, I much would rather watch the men's or the pairs or something from that. I, mean, I have rewatched 2000, but oh, it'll be. Sorry. I think it will be really, really interesting. I think it will be interesting because we have not yet judged with someone who is actually judging them. Three elitist queens judging an event. Just, yeah, just being elite all over the place. <laughs> like, it'll be great. It'll be great. I'm fascinated with how this is going to go. He is going to be so entertaining. Is he yeah, excited? And he, 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 well, he was going to try to pull his... He saves all his Olympic notes. actual notes from the moment. So yeah. he was in process of trying to find those at the time. Oh. So, but even if he doesn't have them, I think just to judge it again would be interesting. He's but a to have his notes from the night, I think that would be incredible. Oh my god! I mean, that's real insight. I mean, with that twenty-dollar bill attached to his scorecard from Robin Wagner. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so also, that's a joke. That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> like, I feel like you have to. Well, yeah. Speaking of other old queens that we love. Uh, Liz Manley was ta- talking about <laughs> Doug Hall. Oh, I thought you were referring to Liz Manley as the queen. Okay, all right. I mean, they're both. I mean, yeah, she exactly. was saying that Doug Hall has an eyebrow obsession. That he's obsessed oh. with people's eyebrows and like telling the boys when they need to start waxing them and like get rid of the unibrow. And you know, this well, is... you know what? I believe that because it's a normal thing that happens. But like when that camera cl- like it gives you the close up, we're aware. And then there's that one kid that has like ex- very extra eyebrows. The but junior. I was like, Does Doug Hall like my eyebrows? Or has he been? Looking? He would like your eyebrows. They're very clear. They're very Thank clean. You, but they're not as good as they were before quarantine, of course. But you know. Of course. Well, mine are like two squirrels at the moment. So and you know that I don't do it myself. I don't know if I've ever talked about this on here, but I'm compulsive. And I'm afraid of being like Tasha Schweikert or Crystal Uslak circa 2002, where these gymnasts would over pluck their eyebrows. Oh, that's maybe it was the only thing they had control over in their lives, right? And they would. Yeah. That's the thing. That's a thing. One hand, like Whoopi Goldberg, okay? (laughs) Egot. (laughs) So I'm very, yes, I'm very excited and nervous about judging this event. Actually, as nervous as I was for people's reaction to the pair video from 2002, but I'm also excited about it too. So I think that means it'll be a good video. It has that like pit in the stomach. Did we both, I had the Russians win and you had the Canadians win? Is that, that's how we ended up on that. But we both had Plushenko in fourth for the 2010 video. I know when, when we did those final tallies, I was like, wow, we sent a message. Yeah. We actually were consistent. We both had the same one, two, and four. We just flipped three and five. So, yeah. Yeah. You'll have to tune in to figure out how. <laughs> it was. We defended our marks. What was so funny is that, you know, the Daisuke fans are like very um, loyal and yeah. so all things. Yeah. Count me among them. Yeah. Like it was. Tr- our, our judging was translated into Japanese about like what our opinions were, <laughs> which like normally I'd be like, it's on Patreon for a reason. Like it's. Oh, private. I see. I gotcha. But I gotcha. it was just like so amusing to me. Like, have you ever gone to that blog that FGSK8 and it's the Japanese blog where they I've post all the this videos? One. Yeah, yeah. And the translation of our name, half the time I'm translated to be David Reese. Is the way that okay. they translate. Yeah, well, it's a literal letter situation. Yes. Yeah. But like they spell it R E I S S. And they'll, okay. they'll write David Reese of the skating lesson and Jonathan Byer of the opera singer. Are like, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just, it, it warms um, my heart so singing. much every time. That's, like, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, uh, it's funny, these like translation like circuits, even when we read these Buyanova articles and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, it just needed one more through. Russian question. What? When they say the word skate, it translates in articles to something different. And oh my God, I'm forgetting what it is now. Oh, they call it riding. So is that just a word? Mm. Why does it translate to ride? Because is there a verb to skate in Russian? Do they call it like riding or something? Like it's just different. Because yeah. sometimes there's different terminology and sometimes there's like in some 
article translations, and I forget if it's Russian or what country, the balance beam is called like the log. You're doing the log. And <laughs> but, like, that's just like a literal translation of like beam, right, wood, right. whatever. So I always laugh at like- Well, it's even in the German, like they use the word running for also skiing. Like skiing. it's, yeah, because you're like running the snow. But is that what they I, really say? Is like the phrase in German, like running the slope? Is it? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's like, it's snow running, okay. basically. So for next yeah. week's This and That, Jonathan, I have a homework that I think will be really fun that we should add in the, in the okay. video. Okay. So Pendler Russian 1 is on YouTube, mm -hmm. right? And I have... And do, you, do you like that better than Duolingo, which is my go-to? Well, I find Pimsleur hilarious and, like, very fun. Okay. Because they have conversations. It's an interesting way of learning how they keep, like, it's a, it, they have acquired language. And also they have, like, two people having a conversation. So I feel like we should recreate the conversation that happens at the end. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> and the first conversation in Pimsleur Russian 1 is like, um, hi, hi. Do you speak English? Or, or and you're like, are you American? Yes, I'm American. Or like, do you like? Do you understand Russian? I understand Russian a bit. Where's oh, Red so Square? So you're supposed to lie in the video? Yeah. Okay. Like, Where's Red Square? <laughs> Red Square is there. And then you're like, thank you. And then like you, you so you, you learn this conversation. I think we need to do it. I think it would be great. Okay. 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 I know that it's it interesting because like, I, I threatened to do French during this time. Okay. Um, because it's my weakest. I have, have you tried the German and French. No, I've not tried any of the Pimslers, just the Duolingo, but sometimes also they're teaching sentence structure and just vocabulary and you're putting together sentences that then you step back and you're like, the cow handed the table a glass of water for later. And you're like, wait, what? This one, I <laughs> really? think you'll like that they really break down the sound of each syllable. Okay. And they'll take a long word, but and it's interesting is that they do the word reverse. So they start at the end of the word and they build it oh, back. Interesting. I don't know if they, okay. I actually tried the Japanese. It was similar. It was good too. But um, the Russian one, I used to go further and I used to do it while I was driving. And then at a certain point, it became like too intense. An actual distraction. Yeah. yeah. I would imagine because you're really listening. Yeah. yeah. And then I was like, I think I fucked that up. Oh, man. You know, and you would. Yeah, exactly. I, but yes, it's, it's so. Because we need to be able to watch all these documentaries that know. Because you know the Russians love 100%. to say, you know the, the number one, because Russians love to gaslight, right? So if they say, if it's anything negative about Precious Satera, you know that they are going to claim that the translation is bad and that right. you are like silly Americans and that like whoever- You've got to become the expert. Yeah. Whoever translated it for you was obviously wrong and like blah, blah, blah. blah. You, you know what they're going to write, right? So Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So we just, yes. And if I brush up the French, then I can read all and those articles about- And someone should make like a Pimsleur things. skating terminology. Like what? Because like you could do a Russian language course, but you never learn all of the terms that are exclusive to skating, right? Like there's 100%. certain lingo. Yeah. yeah. So how do we say like to skate, to jump, to practice right. this? I think someone should make like figure skating Russian, you know, for... Yeah. Grade as in grade of execution or you yes. know what I mean? Like these, these particular terms, they wouldn't have taught you otherwise. Totally. I love though when you're watching certain foreign language broadcasts and they just use the English. Yes. You know, like Tolub. Tolub, yes. Yeah, and, and it just pops out of the fabric and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> but I, I have done the Pimsleur Russian one, like the first 10, like many times. I could tell you where Red Square is. Okay, <laughs> there. <laughs> it's either there or here. It's either tam okay. or this, it's this, ah, right? Like, okay, okay. Could you cross near Plushet? Красная площадь, да. Right. Oh, oh, and listen to that L. The, you got it down. Yeah. Bushkin speaks this. Right? Like you can. Oh my God. It's, it's so fun to speak. It's a fun language to sing in, too. You can't do as much like the woo, but. Uh, right. There's. And like the word to, like, do you want something to drink? I know it's like the word something is like stony boot, and then it's like stony boot vipit, and then you're like, it's just like fun. <laughs> like I don't know. It's like, <laughs> that's great, but it should be a game. Like what is what a fun thing to do? Yeah. So I would, I recommend. I'll put it in the description okay. box. We'll all okay. Okay. We'll all practice our our Russian together and yes. come back to recreate 
directional scenes about Red Square. <laughs> I can be Lena and you can be the guy. I forget what the guy's name is. It's like there are okay. two of them at the okay, end. Awesome. And the end of every so the end of every Pimsleur episode, lesson, whatever you want to call it, they have like a conversation. And they'll say, say the word for and the narrator's voice is great. So ask him. <laughs> like you... Stop telling me what to do. <laughs> And it built. It's great. It's like a Tarasa okay. step sequence. It builds with edges and arms and ornamentation. Comes to a frenzied climax. Yeah, yes. exactly. Okay. But yes, we do need a Tarasa of a Pimsleur lesson. So done and done. We'll have to work on this. We'll get like our our Russian friends on it. It could be our Dina can teach us on Dina. Zoom. <laughs> How do you call someone? You're skating like a slow fat cow. <laughs> like, <I don't> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> or like. You are a pregnant spider. How do you say that in Romania? Like, horrible. Yeah, exactly. And they would they would give you a name. Is that how they would tell you how to say it? They would say who? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, hold an edge. Oh, another great docu series that I'm watching. Remember when I got into basketball books that one summer? Yeah. On ESPN, they're currently airing The Last Dance with, and you're from Chicago land, so. Yes, I was at the, I was at one of, one of the final games. I think they won six times, those championships. Six, yeah. But I saw him play live. We were on the court and I couldn't have cared less. I had my face full of nachos and cheese. <laughs> you didn't like that charisma? Is he better on TV? Were you just? Oh, it was pretty amazing to see in person, but it was also, I saw Dennis Rodman, who definitely had real presence, and Scottie Pippen. Now, is this the one that has everybody feuding about Scottie Pippen versus Michael Jordan, or is this just a Chicago phenomenon? Well, they I were saying think something it's about Scottie him making versus a Michael so far. It's more Scotty. Scotty's last season, there was a lot going on with his contract negotiations. I've read two books. And I think season. that's what was happening. Yeah. Is it like, People have been speaking on Scotty Pippen's defense to say this was bullshit, how it was de depicted, and da 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 da. Well, they go into it. In it. It's fascinating because I, I read Phil Jackson's books, Eleven Rings, which is great. If you are interested in how coaches work with teams and get players to work together with different personalities or management and leadership, I thought it was a fascinating book. Tabitha Yim recommended it, and I loved that. And I loved it so much, I read a book about him called Mindhunter so that I could get his, I don't remember if I read Mindhunter first and then this one is I got his perspective and the perspective about him. So I felt- But they use his book even in corporate training and yes. stuff like that. Yeah. Cause he talked about like how he got Dennis Rodman to be on the same page and how he got other people to not want to like maim Dennis Rodman for being so extra and, and things like that. Right. So, and I, uh, anyway, it's great, but Scotty had signed a long-term contract that was undervalued. And the way that the 90s exploded and the um, basketball, you know, exploded, he went up making, like, he was ranked, like, 122nd in terms of salary, even though he was probably... Mm, top player. Top, yeah. One of the top players in the league. And the guy who ran the Bulls was like, no, I'm not going to renegotiate your contracts. I don't do that. But I think they renegotiated for other for Michael Jordan. I'm pretty sure that they did. Anyway, they okay. like always kept Scottie Pippen down a little bit, and then you kind of. So he got injured after the one year and said that he he waited to have his surgery, because they were also thinking about trading him. So he kind of had the attitude of like, well, you don't think you need me? I'll put off my surgery. You'll see how you enjoy mm, that. How important I am. Yeah, he was right. But then the team was like, well. He threw us under the bus for him. So it's all a whole bunch of... Yeah. It gets complex at those levels. It's complex, yeah. but it's a great docuseries. It's on... I think they do two episodes every Sunday, but you can watch on the ESPN website. But it's okay. very okay. fascinating. And they have the, all, the, all of them talking, so... Oh, interesting. I watched okay. the first two, but the third one is about Dennis Rodman, so I'm kind of excited. I know, it's so funny. Remember that wedding? <laughs> the wedding. Remember how he goes to North Korea to meet with... Yeah, and they use that as that um, byline in 30 Rock with Tracy Morgan's character being a, an action star in North Korea. It's based on the Dennis Rodman stuff. <laughs> like... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway, hold an edge, look sexy. Bye, everyone.